Happy New Year, everybody. The truth about business is back with a bang. And in this week's episode, you'll discover the following three business insights. Number one, how transitioning from being the technician to an entrepreneur totally revolutionized our featured guest's mindset and changed his business for the better. Number two, why it's important not to get distracted by big headline numbers and lose focus of the one that really matters, profit. And number three, the two things you can never get wrong with your employees or you run the risk of losing them forever. So stay tuned for all of this and so much more on this week's episode of The Truth About Business. I'm Benjamin Brain, and by day, I'm a director of a multi-award winning family run business. And by night, I interview successful business owners to share their journeys, experiences and truths to serve as inspiration, motivation and first-hand education for like-minded entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to fast-track our own business success. This is the truth about business, told by those who have been there, done that and have the scars to prove it. From the good times to the bad, the marketing strategies and sales tactics to the productivity hacks and success habits. I'm here to give you the de-sugar-coated version of what it's really like and what really works. If you're thinking of starting a business or are already in business, I created this for you. So let's get started. Before we do, I just want to give a quick shout out to Kay Mahay, who left me a brilliant five-star review on iTunes. It's much appreciated and I do read everyone. So if you get the chance and would like a shout out on the show, you know what to do. Let's get back to the interview. In this week's episode, I talk business with Kevin Huffington. Now, Kevin started out his career in the military, going on to serve in the Gulf War and amongst many other roles and responsibilities, becoming an Arctic combat instructor. His passion for health and fitness saw him become the champion of the popular TV fitness competition on ITV, Body Heat, back in the 90s, and then he followed that up with becoming an audition finalist for the Gladiator TV series. Working his way into the health sector, Kevin went on to launch the Central Health Network, which is today a nationally recognised and award-winning healthcare provider with a team of over 20 employees and several locations providing services such as physiotherapy, occupational health services, osteopathy and podiatry across the East Midlands for both the public and private sectors. To find out more about Kevin and the services his team provides, check out www.centralhealth.org.uk or you can find him on LinkedIn under Kevin Huffington. As with all businesses, Kevin's journey has not been without his fair share of challenges and major lessons learned along the way. And he spills all the beans in another brilliant interview with an inspirational entrepreneur who has managed to figure out that work-life balance dilemma that so many of us struggle with. You know, success leaves footprints. So let's take a walk with a passionate entrepreneur and owner of Central Health Network, Kevin Huffington. Right, so Kevin, welcome to The Truth About Business. Thank you for joining us on the podcast show today. Now, it's uh, my pleasure. I've been looking forward to coming along for a few weeks, actually. So, Kev, can you tell us, if you had to boil your speciality down to one thing, what would it be? The business speciality I really want to focus on, really, is, is sort of occupational health, because it encompasses a lot of the stuff that we do as a whole, which is private health care for the corporate sector uh, and, and individuals working within that environment. Okay, so for somebody that's never heard the phrase occupational health, could you give us a bit of a summary of what you actually mean by that? Yeah, so uh, what it is, it's actually delivering assessments and uh, management of individual employees maybe contained within a business that might be struggling with uh, you know back pain or a mental health issue uh, we provide the, what we call the primary care services so we actually provide clinicians that uh, will then go in or they'll come to us and we'll we'll sit down we'll, we'll assess them medically uh, and based on the findings put a report together and advise on recommendation management recommendations of, the, of that employee so for the businesses that take occupational health seriously and go about it in the right way what are some of the the benefits it's usually long-term sickness absence which is one of the main ones so if you've got an employee that's off work and uh, you know they're continually getting uh, sick note off their GP then you know we get a lot of HR managers that will maybe contact us to talk about assessing an individual about managing them either in or out of work or recommendations you know phase returns 
Yeah, that type of thing. We also uh, failed to mention was uh, health surveillance, which is a big part of certainly the manufacturing uh, environment where uh, there's a legal requirement to uh, maintain the health of employees. So people working on shop floors with machinery, loud noises. So we do, you know, things like uh, audio. So the hearing tests, uh, lung tests, uh, vision tests, skin tests. So we're looking at the health, the health and well-being of all those employees. And it's very much an interest of a, of a company to do that. You know, it improves productivity, it reduces long-term sickness absent management and, and the requirement of management. It uh, increases productivity. There's some research out uh, to suggest that morale increases, therefore productivity increases. There's no uh, requirement to replace uh, replace people with agency workers. And you can offset the worst case scenarios, tribunals. So Kev, what's the one thing about your speciality that seems simple to you? You're in the business day to day. You're obviously an expert in that area of speciality that you think people should know, but you tend to find don't. Yeah, I mean, a lot of companies just get stuck into a, a normal, uh, you know, just just routine patterns of work. Uh, you know, sometimes it's it can be fairly simple and just simply rotating employees r- around a work shop or, a, a, you know, a working environment just to change what they're doing on a daily basis. Where do you see businesses going wrong with it? Do you see businesses that are trying to get it right but are doing something wrong? Oh yeah, I mean, you get all sorts. So you get businesses that really just don't haven't haven't got a clue what to do. Really, they're really struggling with it. You know, as far as they can see that this, you know the GP's just signing their, that, that this individual off, they really struggle with it, and they'll just let it happen. You know, there's consequences of that is that you know loss of productivity and there may be some sick pay involved and everything else. But yeah, first of all, you know they struggle to know what to do at all. And then the other issue is they're not, they, they've got an idea what to do, but they really don't know what to do properly. And that's where sometimes we get contacted through HR manager and they'll say, you know, how, can you help us with this individual? With This is the particular issue. And that's how we move on, really. And we're quite happy to give advice and we give free advice at that stage. And then we get further information through a triage. So we ask them to give us information, consented, everything's consented and it's very, com- it's all confidential, especially with the new data protection rules now. In fact, occupational health is very data sensitive anyway, even before the GDPR rules changes uh, last year. So yeah, so you tend to find in the marketplace, a lot of companies don't quite know what to do. And that's part of our role as well, is to educate. And if you could leave the audience with one piece of advice or one tip to help them improve their occupational health. So I'm sure that we've all been through experiences where a a member of the team has been signed off sick that, like you say, has affected the team because they've had to bring in people who are agency workers that might not necessarily have that speciality or just haven't replaced them full stop until they come back. Is there like a first step that you can recommend people take to put them in a slightly better position when those things happen? Just seek advice. You know, I mean, I think uh, we get lots of organic uh, inquiries, you know, word of mouth where, you know, someone's just struggling. So my advice is a good occupational health advisor should give some service, uh, should give you some good advice, really. It shouldn't cost you anything. And, you know, just get some advice on that. The GPs, they're okay, And some will sometimes suggest an occupational health assessment anyway. But yeah, that'd be my advice. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So we know a bit more about your speciality, Kevin, and what you really specialise in at Central Health. Now, how long have you been in business so far with Central Health? I uh, became a partner in 2004. Okay. So that's when I started. So can you give us a bit of a summary of your career leading up to the launch of Central Health back in 2004? If you can cast your mind back all the way to the beginning and then talk us through how that's progressed to, to where you are today. Leaving school? We'll go for school. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go for the full story. If you like, I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, but uh, have yeah. got time, don't worry. <laughs> Well, I mean, I left the school. Actually, uh, I joined the, boy, the Army Boy Service. I was a junior soldier, actually. I, I left before taking my exams. So just, just as I was turning 16, I joined the Army and did boy service for a year. From there, I did trade training. So I was, I was a trades person. Uh, I was in communications, actually. I worked with satellites and things like that in, in the end. But yeah, I, I was a career soldier. I did a couple of uh, quite neat things. I used to teach in the end. I, did, I was a physical training instructor. I was based in a training wing. I used to teach... The ranges, so I used to take the troops down the ranges. I did a couple of low-level special special uh, sort of operation type work. And then I ended up specialising in Arctic warfare. So I became what you call an Arctic warfare instructor uh, and survival instructor in Norway. So I used to work there three months every year 
in Norway. That was after the Gulf War. So I was involved in the Gulf War, for the first Gulf War. I was, again, before that, I was involved in the independence of Namibia in 1988. So if anyone out there is old enough to remember, <laughs> I don't think Ben is. But uh, yeah, so we helped the, in, uh, the independence of that. If you look at your history, it was about the Angolans running the, uh, so it was involved with the communists as well before the, the Iron Curtain fell down. So there's a little bit of history there. But yes, I spent a year in Africa in different places and then came back first Gulf War and then yeah specialized in, in Arctic warfare weapons things like that physical training and I represented the army at triathlon so I was uh, cross-country skiing so I was quite physical yeah so you've always had an interest in health and fitness going way back yeah. there yeah 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 so it's always been you know I've, I've, I've brought up with it I mean the British army is, is what you call a running army so you know the Americans is they like their press-ups they like their army uh, pull-ups but the, the British army is renowned for running and so yeah so if you had anything like that about you that they liked you very much okay and that could take you places open doors yeah I left in 94 anyway and then uh, I went back into education I went to the health and fitness industry worked in management taught classes personal trained for a little bit didn't quite like it wasn't quite structured for me and then I went back into education did my levels in a year got B's and then got on to, went to Sheffield University to do a physio degree. So I did a three-year physio degree and then qualified and worked in the NHS for two years. And during that period, I worked, started to work privately. And I came across a small business in Derby, actually. And they offered me a small, what you call, associate role. I took it on. I got on board. And this is a top tip, I think, from any business person. I'm a big believer in if, if you can just offer added value to any business as an employee as an associate it will open doors for you i'm com- completely completely convinced about that it opened doors for me can you give us an example of what you mean by that can, yeah can well you... I, I mean i got involved uh, with a very s- small operation and i was able to develop more work for them so that was, that was private physio at the time uh, that's all they did was just private physiotherapy so you know i'm quite a dynamic individual whatever i try and do i try and do the best i can so i added value in that i created more work therefore i you know increased their profits their turnover and the partners didn't actually get on very well, actually. So they agreed that what you know, between them that would offer me a, a partnership. So I was offered a partnership, took it. And then I realized, actually, and that was my first experience of business, really, at the front end. And, and, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, if you can stay away from a partnership, stay away from a partnership. My partnership was pretty sour, actually. I could understand why they didn't get on. So that was a very steep learning curve. Part of that is we wanted to develop the actual physical building. So we bought our own lo- first location and took it from there. But then my partner wanted to be what you call a silent partner. So they wanted me to do all the work. To cut a long story short, I was able to move them off, off from the business and I took the whole thing over in 2007. So I became a sole trader in 2007. And at that stage, I wanted to develop the business beyond just physio. Uh, we had a small NHS service at that stage, GP contracts. And I just developed from there. So we renamed the business, rebranded it. Central Health Network Limited is the company name with a view to developing private healthcare in the streams that we do now. So it was just a case of developing all that. So it was physio, occupational health services. So that's doctors and nurses, technicians, psychologists. And then we brought on osteopaths. We've got central osteopaths, central foot clinic, which is the podiatry team. And, you know, offering that full a remit of, of healthcare services to the corporate sector, to individuals and contract work. So uh, we developed our contract work with the NHS. So we, we you know, one of the largest providers of, of GP uh, physio MSK services in Derby in the local area now. So that, that, that was always what we tried to do. We're in that process now of, of developing that. Yeah. So, so you've now become a business owner, which is quite a way away from, uh, you know, the regimented yeah. routine life of, of the British Army. Back then in the earlier days, did you ever see yourself as an entrepreneur? If somebody had told you at the time you were going to become a business owner, what would you have said? No, not really. No, I was a career soldier really at the time. No, no, I didn't see it. No, I actually, I've always been quite good with money. So I did actually buy a couple of properties. So I actually, I did a couple of rentals on the income that I was in uh, while I was in the army, actually. So thinking about that, maybe it was in the, maybe it was in the DNA a little bit. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I, I, I did, I've always been into my fitness. I still am actually, I'm 53 now. So I'm still trying to keep my 40, 40 minute 10 Ks going. So I'm still uh, out there competing and stuff like that. But part of that, I've always had that, that little bit of competitive edge as well. I like, you know, self against myself more than anything else. So, you know, I won a couple of fitness shows in, in the nineties. So I did body heat and won that in 1996. If anyone out there can remember that, uh, that was Jerry Guscott and Sally Gunnell. I think it was BBC, uh, no, sorry, ITV. And we won this won the final in South Africa. That was in 1996. Wow! What yeah. was the grand prize for winning that? 10k. Okay, but do you worth know what? winning. Yeah, and I did a loft conversion with it. So maybe I'm convincing myself it probably was in the DNA a little bit, but I didn't actually know it at the time. And I still have that property right now. And then I went on, and in 1998, I was an audition finalist for Gladiators. So 
you know, I've always, I've always, and I still, I still like my fitness and stuff now. So anyone out there might see me running around in one of the local 10Ks. And then a part of the business, of course, uh, we're very, I'm, I'm, I'm a big adv- advocate of exercise and health and well-being and stuff. So we've also sponsored locally as well. So our first sponsor was a Ramathon in 2014, I think. Yeah, so that was the Ramathon. That was the first venture into sponsorship. And then following that, we sponsored the 10K, so the Derby 10K. So it was a Central Health Derby 10K for three years. Yeah, so they're just uh, the Derby community trust have just taken that over now. Yeah, and with those sort of sponsorships, when you are sponsoring those events, sponsoring those events as a business, is it more you are sponsoring it because you enjoy it and you want to help promote it, or do you actually do it as part of that, or does it is it worthwhile with regards to the business that you generate off the back of it as well? So for other people that are thinking of sponsoring these sort of events, should they be doing it for a return on investment, or should they be doing it because it's something that they're passionate about? It, it's difficult. Return on investment, we've learned that is is very hard to quantify, and in fact, we can't quantify it. You know, you you can do all the best things in the world. You know, ask people, Google, whatever it is, but it's very difficult to. So it's about brand awareness for us. That's what it was about. It was about developing the business. It was about just people being familiar with us yeah so so more 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 passion more wanting to be involved with the health and health element of that and not a direct return on investment i think if you speak to a lot of sponsorship people i'm not a, a sponsorship expert but i think that's where sponsorship is it's about brand awareness and that could be you know three years after you did sponsor the event you know it's, it's just timing really where people are maybe with a health issue that they may have and then following that, of course, we've done we've done the sports awards. So we got involved with the Derby Telegraph Sports Awards. So we sponsored, I think, the Young Sports Person of the Year. That was about two years ago. And then this year we've sponsored the Chamber Small Business of the Year. And that was more corporate. So, you know, it was just different sponsorships for different reasons. And again, pure, you know, from our t- point of view, it's not direct return on investment at all. It's just making people aware of, of us. And then we're getting involved with what we call the Derby Run Trail next year. So again, look out for that next year for all the local residents in Derby. It'll be a, a big do. But they're putting quite large Ram replicas around the city and it's going to be painted up by different companies that sponsor the Dam, uh, Derby Ram. And there'll be a trail developed around that. Again, it's all about health. They're trying to encourage people to walk around and have a look. They're going to develop an app, I think, so it can be virtual reality and things. So it should be should be quite a, a good event. So that's, that's from the Derby Museum. So we're getting involved with them next year. And then going back to your own journey of becoming a business owner were there any family members before you that had ventured out to start a business on their own or were you one of the first no I'm the first as far as I'm aware and I've got to say I've I've grown into it I've had a a, a few hurdles and I think if you speak to most business people I think it makes you stronger I've learned lots you know you're always learning I didn't have any business knowledge going into the business and I made a few mistakes you know going through how you manage people how you talk to people what you're trying to do and stuff like that so you know it's a it's a big learning curve very very steep I would say not easy we have always been regarded as relatively successful but approximately three what three or four four years ago you know our turnover was great but the profit wasn't great we had to restructure actually so you know from a business point of view I've learned more in the last three years or so having restructured and learnt lots more about how the business operates grew quite quickly it became very organic we sort of lost a little bit of control of the business and part of that restructuring process was getting the right people in the right place with the right skill set and then me becoming more involved again and understanding the business and what was happening where and when and it's it's helped us significantly and I've learned more in the last three years than I have in the last 10 so yeah, it's, uh, so it, it sounds to me like at, at this point where you, you were talking about with regards to over the last three or four years, that it's a classic case of making that transition from being the, as we were talking about before we started, being the technician and working in the business yeah. and practicing your expertise and honing your craft versus actually working on the business and, and helping it to grow and identifying the problems and working out solutions. Is that the transition that you, you've, you've been through yourself? Def- definitely. I think getting involved with the direct frontline service of the business takes you away from the business. And I've learned a huge amount about that. I mean, I step away from the actual frontline services. Now I do still get involved. I love the, cl- the clinical side of things. I love assessing. I'm a back specialist. So I, I, you know, I still do private clinics, but I've reduced those quite significantly, but I would never stop them. But it's all about restructuring my diary and I, I it's specific times now. And I spend most of my time now, you know, four years ago, it'd probably be 90% 
as a technician, which means actually de- delivering a service, going out and doing a clinic, and 10% of the business. I mean, that's reversed now. I mean, it's completely reversed now. I'm just getting the right people in the right place. I'm working on the business. I enjoy the business side of it. I really do take to it. And I think that's a big part of it. I think you've got to enjoy that. I enjoy going out and uh, trying to generate business and talk to people. Again, how you approach that, I think is very important. I like to come across as very sincere. I like to deliver a good service, honest, you know, and I think that's a big part of it. And there's nothing worse than, you know, delivering a poor service or not delivering the service that you've promised in the way that you have promised. I mean, it's a very fine line. But uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think the difficulty that a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs face is the reason they get into business for themselves is because they are doing something that they love beforehand and decide to start on their own. So they're making that transition from stepping away from doing what they love to be an actual business owner is something that people find very hard to get their heads around. You know, if you're a photographer and you start a photography business, you do that because you love taking photographs. You know, for yourself, you love delivering that actual service to the clients. So what, so for somebody out there that's in that position right now, that they, they know they need to step away from the technician side of the business to help it grow, what were some of the tactics and, and strategies and things that you did to help you switch your mindset, but actually put those things into action and get to the position that you're in now? Yeah, I, I, and recruitment's very important. You, you need the right people in the right place, you know, with the right skill set. I spent much more time, I've got to say, on supervision working with people and how you wanted the business to work. So, so that's a significant difference. I still work with, we do supervision every week with the clinicians and, and you know, it's getting people to operate and replicate what you're trying to do. It's difficult, but you've got to keep working on it and try and sell that to the individual, incentivize, motivate. Uh, and these are skills that you develop, you know, so as an entrepreneur, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good skills set to have, but to be able to step away from the business, you've, you've got to, and still deliver it, you've got to put that person in place to deliver the service where you can step back and then develop the business, go out and generate more work. What we do now is, again, you know, we're still growing and part of the plan is to, is to develop further. As we bring work on, then we look for the next individual to come on board and we, we test them out and see if they've got the, the skills to, to come and join and, and deliver that service. And we spend a lot more time in training. You know, it's, it's just the time to get people to operate how you want them to operate. Yeah, and, and I think you have to have a certain self-awareness of both yourself and where you're spending your time and is it being spent best delivering the service or growing the business and, and the actual current situation of the business itself. So when you first made this realisation of you need to reorganise your priorities so you can grow the business to where you want it to be, was it one particular event or was it sort of a, a gradual realisation over time that these things needed to change? It was gradual. It was It was probably over, a, actually, it was over about a six-month period. Again, we struggled with a good accounts manager, actually. We, we struggled to get a decent person doing that job. And we did get someone involved who actually started to highlight some of the issues. And that was really important. And I've got to say, that's probably the real eye opener at that stage where I had someone that was honest, reliable, was looking at, you know, our interests as a business and, and flagged up the fact that, you know what, you know, it's, it's your numbers, your turnover is good, but your profit margins, you know, really need looking at. And that's when you, you know, you, 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 you become these silly fools where, you know, the turnover figure is great, but your profit margin is very low. So that was a real that was a real opener, eye opener for me, and I, that's when I really started looking back into the business and what was happening. You know, the, the headline figure looked great, but at the end of the day, you know, I was looking at the bank account and I was thinking, you know, it's we're, we're working really we're really busy. We got some good work coming in, but you know what, the bank account's flat. What's happening here? You know, and a lot of it was going out, uh, and it's that realization that you know what, it's it's not this isn't quite right. You know, the margins aren't right. We have to look at our costs and overheads and stuff like that. So it's, it's very interesting. And, I, and what was really interesting this year was being part of the sponsorship, small business sponsorship, it was actually the f- three or four finalists. And we were able to, uh, part of the judging panel, I was able to have a look at some of these un- companies' books and their accounts and stuff. It was just really interesting read, you know, and, and it's interesting. Some companies have really good top-level turnover figures. And then you look at them and the pr- actual profit margin is actually quite low. And you think, oh my God, you know, it it looks great on paper, but actually they're not making huge amounts of money. It's it's very interesting and and different types of businesses. Yeah, it's the old saying, isn't it? It's turnover is vanity, but profit is sanity. And I always wonder is that as well. There was the recently, there was the the Derbyshire top 200 businesses that came out where it showed you what their turnover was. And, you know, there was hundreds of millions, you know, tens of millions. But what would be more interesting, like you'd say, 
is which has got the highest profit margin Absolutely. because those are the businesses that you want to look at to see what sort of strategies and, and operations they're using to implement in your own business so but that i suppose really rings true for you now and I, when you were looking at these accounts of the business finalists yeah were you seeing people in the same situation that you were in three or four years ago that maybe hadn't had that realization yet well i don't know i mean they were making profit I and mean, there's no doubt about it but i was just i was you look at the turnover figure and I, you know i think there was one company it was it was into the millions but actually the profit was probably less than 100k you know i mean it was just it was massive it was the type of sector they're in i don't want to go into it but you know it was just the realization you because know, you don't get the opportunity to look at other people's business or accounts and their you know their structures and stuff and it's just very very it's like these it's like this podcast it's very interesting to listen to people and you know how uh, listen to their experiences and what they do and i think most people do go through the same sort of stuff i think you know you read books and you hear stories don't you about some people actually physically failing i mean i felt that what we did three or four years ago, having to restructure into what we're doing now was not quite a failure because we didn't go bust and we didn't fail, but it was one of those moments. And it, and then you learn so much and you, you then hear about all these serial entrepreneurial entrepreneurs, you know, that seem to be able to, and I think it's, I think it's, you learn that it, there's a method, there's a method and it's got to be all based on margins and costs. And, you know, you've got to look at your market, who you're selling your service to. And it's all these little bits that you do read uh, certainly, you know, you, when you're first starting out, you'll read a business book, won't you? Or you'll hear talk to people and you sort of look at it and it doesn't quite make sense, I don't think, until you, you're in it and doing it. Mm. And then you sort of think, yeah, do you know what? It is that I need to do that, you know? And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a steep learning curve and you're constantly learning. So, so going back to when you separated from your business partnership yeah. and decided to, to, to take the business on for yourself... Were you restructuring the business then or were you going to be providing the same services? Was there a big change from how the business was before to what it transitioned into once you were the sole owner of it? Yeah. So I, t- I mean, not, not initially because uh, I suddenly realized, oh, my God, this is, you know, I've got this business now. And I was, I, you know, it was a status quo a little bit. And I've got to say, you know, it was, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be fair. Did you feel ready for it at the time? Uh, not to run the business as in like if I reflect back on where I am now. No. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was floundering a bit, you know, and I, I thought it was e- it was going to be easier than I thought. And it's just about managing people and understanding what's going on. I didn't I didn't really, you know, and it's it is. And um, yeah, it took me a while. And then I, I still didn't get it right. It took me some years to get it right. I've got to say, I mean, you know, how you manage people and what you want, where and, and I mean, two valuable things I always think is that two things. If you've got employees, there's two things never to get wrong. And that's Money, pay, and holidays. So you know, we had, I had looked at over. I looked at some of the payments, salaries, and everything else, and I was trying to tweak those. And some of the people weren't happy with that. And I had to go through this sort of uh, period of, oh, you know, I've, you know, I've put my foot in there and stuff like that. So th- they're very sensitive. I manage those very differently now. You know, I'd much rather pe- give people more money than take it off them. But certainly from the outset, part of that strategy is to get it right, right from the get go get the contracts sorted out, know what they're going to do. I talk up front about what people expect, their expectations, you know, the margins, everything else, what, what's going on. You know, I get that out front straight away. I've learned that because I've made so many errors about, ah, oh, that's not right. And then when you, when, you've, when you have agreed to do a certain level of payment or, you know, holidays and things like that, and you are looking to, to, with, to reduce them, you know, it really does rock the boat. And, and you, you, know, you never really get that person back, actually. So, you know, trying to look at all that and managing that so you know we don't go we don't have those type of errors now thankfully but you know it's little things like that and if you're not familiar with business and you had you know other people working with you yeah but i took the thing over in 2000 uh, i started to develop it as it is now from 2007 so it took me three years yeah but those are the types of the things that i think regardless of how many business books you read it will never really sink in unless you go through those experiences ah, yeah. yourself and then you've got to get it wrong haven't you to yeah, be yeah, able yeah. to get it right yeah yeah you get you know does that you just got to make those those failures as small as possible i think and different levels. I think, thankfully, you know, we were able to keep going and, and the restructuring really worked for us. Yeah, and, it, and, you know, we've developed again. We're back to where we were. But, you know, from a, from a profit point of view, it's significantly different. You know, the business is really healthy now, you know. Same turnover figures we've worked on, back onto those now. And we're looking to push on from next year. You know, we've got these new websites developing now. We're very much moving into video, vlogging. You know, social media in our sector is quite a big tool so yeah it's you know just trying to get people to more involved with that and in our sector clinicians so health practitioners you know physios doctors nurses stuff like that they're not really business people so they were like me and you have to really 
work on them and and you know try and try and motivate them and and give them the, the support that they need because they're not natural business people health health workers you know so it's always good to have that that sort of mix and and going from the situation that you were in to where you are now like you say you're in a good place you're looking to grow you, you you've really got things going at the moment we've talked about obviously that mindset change and the things that you put in place to to get you working on the business rather than in it would you how much would you attribute that to to get into where you are now was that a, a real significant chunk of it or was there anything else that's really worked for you yeah i mean it's a massive part of it and and seeking advice as well so you know i, I did go out and got some some advice i did a little bit of coaching just to get some some ideas but yeah it, it was a case of how I, I got forced into it really i mean that was that was the bottom line so i i was quite happy doing what i was doing and everything looked pretty good and everything else but actually i was forced into making the changes and i've never looked back actually i mean uh you know i sleep better at night my life is significantly better my work-life balance is significantly better I'm a big exerciser, you know, I really struggled. Sometimes I'd be doing clinics late and the staff would be going home and I'd be working there in the clinic. And what what was keeping me in the clinic was I knew that we were losing money. So there was me staying there till sort of seven or eight o'clock at night working, you know, uh, and the guys were going home and, you know, having their tea with their families and stuff. And I was, I was working hard, keeping the business going. And, I mean, and as a business owner, that's what you have to do. It comes down to you in the, at the end of the day. But, but you know, there are ways of, of reevaluating that, and and that happened to me and i was able to luckily i was able to to get through that that period and to restructure reevaluate restructure after the evaluation and you know my life is completely different now you know it's very rarely now am i working late in clinics and things like that i'm doing the things i enjoy which is the business i go and exercise family and so yeah it's just been it's just been a revelation for me really and i think you have to go through that it's very difficult yeah i agree i think probably almost every guest if not every guest that has been on the show show so far has been through that experience and yeah. it's almost like um a passage of rights yeah, you yeah. Know, you have to go through that to move on to the next stage of yeah. being in the position that you are now and i think sometimes it's perhaps those times when people give up whereas if they just persisted and, and asked for help and seek guidance like you say you went out to get some ideas from other people i suppose the message is there is a way you just have to focus on working out how you can spend more time on the business rather than in it but there is a, there is a light at the end of the tunnel yeah so kev going back to when you transitioned from being a business partner to the business owner under the central health banner now, you've got the, the occupational health, which is the main one that you concentrate on. You've got the podiatry, which is the foot clinic and, and work around that sort of subject. You've got the, the physio stuff and, and the osteopaths. Were those services that you were offering at the time when you were a partnership or have you developed them as you've taken on the business yourself? No, I developed them all after I, I took the business on myself. So from 2007, we rebranded. So I took, I, I was in a partnership from 2004. Then there was a process of about nine months, 12 months of taking the, the, the business over. And then from 2007, I had a plan in my, my mind what I wanted to do. And that was, we, we renamed the business. I got advice on that. We got rebranded and I broke the streams of the business down. So the different elements of the service. So yeah, that was, that was all, all from me really. So Central Health Network was the company name and then we, we developed the different services so how did you know there was a market for all of those services that you now provide before you launched uh, yeah i mean we get asked all the time so you know a, a lot of uh, small operations and you get standalone people that work together now you know so you've got podiatrists working with maybe a, a, an individual physio for example i mean we were doing that years ago and we just wanted to make it much more structured so we knew there's a market out there because you've got standalone services you know you can go to your local podiatrist like you would go to a dentist or a, a small physio somewhere you know an individual working so th there's always a market there but we wanted to tap into that market, but really it, it was a lot more sort of, kind of the corporate end of it as well. So, you know, we really wanted to push into the private healthcare market as a whole. So the branding was important. And so, you know, looking to get contract work as well as the individual work. And so that, that was a motivation really so to, to develop the business. You now work with the NHS, you know, the major insurance companies. I would imagine from an outsider's perspective that that's a pretty competitive market to get into. So how does a business such as yourself compete against other businesses to win those sort of contracts and, and get involved with those types of public businesses? Yeah, I mean, it's public and private. So uh, the occupational health typically is not not solely, but typically co uh, private corporate. So it's, you know, engineering companies. But, you know, uh, I mean, something like 60 to 70 percent of the working population is sitting these days, you know, driving taxis, office workers and stuff. And uh, they, they, they create problems in themselves. So that's mental health. 
you know, sedentary lifestyles and stuff like that. So that, that generates that type of work. But around this local area, there's lots of manufacturing, Burton on Trent. We go all over the region, really. But so that's, that's corporate and public. But there's also contract work with the NHS for occupational health services. So hospitals usually have their own occupational health service. The universities do. We're looking to maybe get involved with the MOD, with my background, X forces you know, looking to maybe open a couple of doors there. The MOD, the tend to outsource a lot of their services now. So you tend to find it, uh, and, and then physio contract work, so NHS and podiatry work, uh, you'll find that, um, or we find that th- there's, there's opportunities to tender. And how do you separate yourself from the other businesses that are going for the same tenders? Is it just all down to cost or are there other things you can do to persuade them to go with you? It's multi, uh, multi-level um, and it's, uh, you know, a lot of local companies like like the the environmental issues you know uh low carbon footprints and stuff so sometimes companies like it looking at using local companies they like companies that reinvest in the local community so you know the sponsorship stuff was very good so that's quite powerful for us you know the 10ks and the the sponsorship stuff that we get involved with yeah and i think it's your pitch you know you've got to you've got to do the written stuff and then uh you know you've got to do the pitch which we're working on all the time really so and you you just try and make yourself you know, stand out by doing those little bits and pieces. I suppose the analogy might be someone, you know, that's you've got a couple of kids that have done their A-levels. You look at the grades, but you might be more interested in the guy that's done the Duke of Edinburgh. You know, it's just that little bit of thing that stands out, really. Same with any recruitment, I think. And I think tenders are very similar. Now, Central Health Network, it's a pretty self-explanatory name. So it fits the business well. Where where did it come from? Was it a light bulb moment or did you get advice from somebody else? Or how did you come up with the name when you rebranded? No, it, it was my idea, actually. So Central Health Network Limited, we're known gen- generally as Central Health, but the actual company registered name is Central Health Network. And the, the, the plan was to have a network. You know, that, that was the, uh, and so it was just looking at what, what domains were available and looking at all that stuff, web email addresses. And because we've got the different, each different service has its own website and, and, uh, but they all link into each other. So there's a, there's a good, good uh, history there. And it was my idea just to split the, the services up and have them stand alone. So we've got, I don't know if anyone out there is familiar with us, but we've got the, the branding is the same. So the logo is the same, but it's different colors for the different services. So it's, it's quite nice. And then central health itself, th- there's lots, lots of opportunities for central health. Yeah, and actually, you know, you can you could roll it out. It's where you start stop, I suppose. So with regards to the, the size of the team and your employees, you brought over a couple of associates from when it was a, a business partnership and, and they were now working with you as the sole business owner. Can you remember bringing on your first full-time employed member of staff? I can't remember by their name now, but I remember realising that, right, is it better to have an associate or is it better now to start employing people? So uh, what, what's the difference between the two? Sorry. Well, it's, it's, it's more of a, you know, a structure and uh, an economic evaluation, really. Obviously, if you're employing someone, then you've got liabilities as a company. You know, there's, there's sick, of course. Then there's salary, holidays. But in our sector, you tend to find that the, the, the self-employed associates will earn uh, more money per hour but they're taking the risk because they're not employed so if they go off they don't get paid whereas the salary guys do and it, it it was all it was weighing that up really and our contract work was starting to develop and it became an economic sense to start employing people to do the work regular work and that's how it developed and how we sort of got into deciding to employ somebody more based on an economic evaluation that it was more more in the business interest to employ them weighing up the holidays you know, any sickness issues. And of course, there's a, there's a training period. And yeah, I mean, in, in that first stage, again, it was all quite unknown exactly what to do. So, you, you know, you're taking a chance, really. What it were some of the challenges out. that you faced trying to find that right person? Was it first interview, bang, yep, you're good for the job, let's go? Or, or how did it pan out? Yeah, I mean, again, our recruitment process has changed over the years as well. And in fact, it's, it's, I, don't, I can't recommend any right way, to be fair. We've tried all sorts of ways. Uh, social media's been pretty good, but then, you know, you know, the old paper advertising and stuff like that. But you used to get loads and loads of applicants, maybe for administration in, in particular. You know, you interview people and they can sound great. The CV can look great. But I've just learned that we just got to get them on the ground. We, we usually you can usually tell in about three weeks i would say uh, you know give or take and there's, there's a there's a running up period and you're not committing and and it's it's you know you just got better at it now our processes now are you, we could refine them much better you know the psychological evaluations and all this sort of stuff we're not moving into that just yet but i i usually for the clinicians now if i'm employing them i go through a recruitment agency i've got a contact these days you just get to learn that it's quite sometimes can be cost effective 
for them to source someone because you can just the deal of course is if they don't fit up to about eight weeks you get all your money back and you know you move on to the next person what are some of the things that you look for in a new recruit now are there any particular attributes or skill sets or even qualifications that you look for when you're bringing people on board our sector they've all got to be qualified so they're all professionals that can sometimes be an issue sometimes there's, there's a very high expectation about what they're ex- what they want and you know what what they're getting from the job so you get all sorts i've had we've had all sorts come through my expectations are really you know if you want anything extra out of the job you know I, I like to see an employee sort of offer us more or add value if they can not initially but you know you'll get some employees that will want more can you pay me more can you give me a higher salary now you don't mind any of that stuff and again i don't think this is sector specific but if they add value then you, an employee is you know you're more likely to to reward that employee you know, there's a lot of employee, a lot of employees that will come and, and, and ask for that type of stuff quite quickly. And you think, you know, if you gave me something, you know, a bit of ad- value to the company, then yeah, no problem. I think about my own experience, you know, and I added value when I uh, when I joined, you know, and it's very early conceived days of this of what we're doing now. And, and I'm a big believer that if you can add value to a company, you know, develop work for them. It's not sex specific either. You could be a solicitor, an accountant, an estate agent. But if you've got someone that comes in and they can generate inquiries, sell your houses, increase your footfall. In our case, it's, you know, private contacts, uh, do a good job so that another company recommends another company. It'll open doors for you. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's not rocket science. I don't think it's difficult to do. And sometimes you can't teach that stuff. So, there's so many sort of middle of the road guys that sometimes I don't think it takes much to actually stick your hand up and just be a little bit more dynamic than someone else. I think it's an everyday, I just feel it's an, it's an everyday attribute. I think it's whatever you do. I've, I, I, for whatever reason, it's always in be, been in built in me. I've always wanted to do the best that I can. Whatever I did in from my army days, you know, the army did set me up, I think, if I reflect back that far, motivation. Resilience is a big thing now. It's a big thing now in the mental health environment, just being resilient enough to keep going, which is a big part of owning a business, I think, and developing. You have to be resilient. You've got to take the knocks. It is hard work. It, nothing is easy. And I think you speak to all the big, big boy, you know, the big players out there, and I'll tell you exactly the same story, I think. I think you've got to take all the knocks. You know, I think some people do think it's easy. You know, and you do see people trying to go off and set something up or do something themselves. And I'll say to the guys that work with us sometimes, you know, I'll say, you know, try and set them up for the future. What is it you want to do? Talk it through with them. You know, do you want to go and set up yourself and do maybe it's a physio that wants to do a, maybe a standalone private physio clinic somewhere. And I say, you're going to have to put the hours in. You know, if someone's ringing you up at eight o'clock at night and they want an appointment at half eight and you've not seen anyone all day, that's what you're going to have to do yeah. because that's business. And that's whether it's selling a house it's it's not easy. So when you're employed, you know, it's a nice environment to be in. It's fairly safe. If you can add value, you know, someone can move up through the business. I'm just a big believer it opens doors for you. Yeah, and it might not be opening doors within the business that you're already in, even if you never get another opportunity within that business. But you never know who you meet. It might be a client that notices that you go the extra mile, that owns a business somewhere else that comes and talks to you and asks you to come and jerk join their business it could be another one of the competition that speaks to you on the phone and they realize that you've got something about you and they they go in the extra mile so I suppose it's to not look at it with blinkered eyes and think well if I put in a load of effort here I'm not going to get anything in return well you might not from that business itself but you never know where life is going to go and the people that you're going to come across so like you say it can open doors in in ways that you never thought possible no definitely well we got we we have young clinicians you know we have them moving through and they'll uh we've got some some European clinicians you know and I also I speak to them as if you know we'll talk about any supervision you know what's what's the plan in the short term with us maybe and I always open up the you know I the idea that they may not want to stay with us and that's fine. But what I'd like to know, like them to understand is that whatever they're doing here, you know, you can take away, you know, wherever you go, whoever you work for, whether it's for yourself or someone else, any business owner will want someone to add value and it will open doors for you wherever you go. I agree totally. It doesn't have to be within the business you're in. So again, Kev, I know we keep going back, but you know, you're sharing some amazing things that are not just industry specific. They will apply to business owners of any business. What was your biggest challenge, would you say, from being involved in that partnership to taking on the business for yourself? Learning to manage people in the right way and, and trying to motivate, motivate them. And very, very, very d- difficult, actually. It took me some years to, to really fine tune it. You know, it's, it's an ongoing process. 
but that, that, that was the, the most difficult, trying to bring people with you. People don't like change. When I got involved with it, I failed to mention, actually, you know, we were paper-based, actually. We had filing cabinets with all the notes and everything. And part of that process is I want to technify ourselves, you know. So we went paper light. So we, we brought in computerized systems and stuff like that. So, again, managing people, people don't like change. And there's a transitional period. And, you, you know, we, we lost one or two because they didn't like the changes. And so managing that was was tough, you know, getting things right, how you wanted it to operate because it made us much more productive. If we, you know, we're now paper light, hardly any paper at all. Our biggest paper producer is the NHS actually. But, uh, you know, if we if we weren't dealing with the NHS so much, we probably wouldn't have any paper hardly at, at all. But that made us much more productive as, as a company. It had to happen. People like doing what they're doing. And I think, again, that's not sector specific, but it made a huge difference productivity wise. And, you know, bringing people on board when that's already changed is really easy then because yeah. they don't know any different. And that, that made like, things very easy. A, a business, you, you know, you've got to be on the front foot. You've got to go with, you know, technology is great. I'm, I like technology, you know, I'm not a big techie, know what's going on type of guy, but I like technology to, if it makes increases your productivity and if I can make life easy, I'm always thinking about the practitioners, you know, our service delivery guys, and making their life as easy as possible. You know, they use laptops, you know, we're in communication all the time. It's all dongle led. They're not dealing with much as, as the least amount of paper as possible. Yeah. I mean, another major incident I forgot, I forgot to mention, actually, when I restructured, actually, I had to lose a couple of people. So, I mean, that was a big, wasn't very nice at all. So I had to move on a couple of people at that stage as well. But we had to review what the roles were happening and who was doing what. So again, managing people, I would say it, it is I've learned a lot. I'm not saying I'm great at it now, but I'm significantly much better than I ever was. And so you've already talked about the first two things are don't get the pay wrong and don't mess up the holidays. <laughs> yeah. But if you could summarise those years experience and what you've learned about managing people in, in a couple of sentences for anybody out there that's about to engage in starting a business for themselves or is probably feeling the same way themselves, what would it be? Get down on their expectations, really pin down what it is you want them to do and, and cut to the chase, you know, talk about, the role and what it is. I mean, I think on reflection, I probably was a bit uh, light around the edges, but people really do want to know. I think it's like having children, you know, they want to know where the, the lines are. I've learned now to do a lot more training with them, actually. I supervise regularly and talk to all the practitioners on a weekly basis. We have 30 minutes. I never used to do that. I've done that now for the last few years. And just making them aware that I'm there to talk, any issues, not only clinical, but, you know, make sure they're okay. That's what I would say. And how, how big is the team now? So how, how much have you grown it up to? Well, I mean, locally, we've probably got, what, 20, 20 plus. And then as work goes, you know, we, we've got regional and then we, we do the odd sort of national type work is we've got associates around and about. So they're actually physically employed by the business, but, you know, and that can vary. So it can, it can expand and then contract again. And then as we bring more work on and we get specific regular work, then that's what, how we develop our employees. So it's quite controlled now. What would you say is your proudest moment so far or your biggest success so far? If you could pick one moment that really stands out, what would it be? Well, for me, I always reflect back on the restructuring period. The biggest thing for me within the business was getting to a point where I, I noticed the business was sort of financially failing and that restructuring period, you know, the, the penny dropping and that period, I reflect back on it now, it was a it was a period where I wasn't sure why I was making the right decisions. Should I or shouldn't I? It was, I had to let some people go. It was a very tough period and I went for it. It had to happen. So that was the biggest rev- revelation throughout the period I've had the business and I've never looked back I've got to say I went with my instinct I did get a little bit of advice on that but I went for it it was a real uncomfortable period really tough period actually for the following 12 months the business you know was riding some some rough waves at the time you know people weren't quite sure they were looking over the shoulder a little bit because I was making changes and they were wondering you know am I the next and all this sort of stuff it was a very very rough period for everybody including myself it wasn't very nice and very comfortable but I've got to say it was definitely the right decision to make. And, you know, my life has never been better since, really. The balance has is, is just been perfect. I've learned so much. And it was a massive learning curve. Amazing. No, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being so honest as well. I think there's a lot of people out there will appreciate that they're not the only people that go through these massive peaks and troughs. You know, it happens to everybody. And so if you could go back to day one of being the business owner for yourself and you could change one thing, only one thing that you think would make the biggest difference to where you are today, maybe have got there faster or, or, or gone down over avenues, what would it be? More tolerance, I think, with employees and, and managing them better. 
in those early stages. You know, I, I struggle to, to get the right people in the right places. So what does the future look like for Central Health over the next 12 months? What have you got in, in, the, uh, in the pipeline that's coming up? Well, uh, you know, everything's looking looking good. We've got, we're trying to be a lot more organised about where we, we go from now. We've got our new websites just being developed at the moment. We're looking to launch those in the new year. Part of that is video now. We're moving much more into video part of the websites as well. So not only content, but actually video explanations, short, short videos, so that subtitles so that people can read them on the trains, you know, just easy access. So, so we're launching those. We've got some big exhibitions next year to then launch different parts of the business and then we're going out to market so we're looking at more tenders and actually going out to the market actively rather than more organically which it has been okay so, so being a bit more proactive rather more than proactive. being reactive but it's yeah. a great position to be in to say that you're in the position now from yeah. being reactive so yeah. you can only really add to that with you with your proactive well i'm much more confident now because it's, it's employees if you want to develop a business and grow it you can only do that with the right people in the right place. We went out and grew certain aspects of the business, but we got let down by individuals and we ended up losing some business because of performance and things. So very sensitive to that. So it's getting the right people in the right place, which is the key. And I think, again, that's a, it's not our sect- sector specifically. It's anything, isn't it? It's wherever you put anyone, anywhere. You just want them to deliver a good service. So that's where more control comes in now. You know, I'm much more comfortable with that, much more confident with that. doesn't mean we're always going to get it right. But you know, that's part of the, the growth now. So Kev, we know about your speciality. We know about your own journey to launching the business and the challenges and the tribulations and the successes that you've been through. I'd now like to tap into a little bit of, of Kev, the businessman slash entrepreneur. So if you could summarize what a day in the life of Kev was like when you first started the business versus what it looks like today, what are some of the major differences there? How does a day pan out for you now compared to back then? In the early stages, you know, I was a technician. So <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I'd spend all my day getting get into this business and just just delivering the frontline service of the business so I, I really didn't spend much time at, at all on the business I just got in, embroiled by delivering the business you know I, I was a physio by trade so I was delivering you know, treatments physio treat, assessment and treatment you know I didn't even do lots of occupational health back then it was really just delivering physio assessment and treatment and and then working full days going home young family and it was just one day into the next really so I didn't really spend much time at all on the business I mean that's the mass the biggest biggest change yeah. from then to now and do you have any daily routines that you try and stick to do you have a particular time of day that you wake up do you have any exercises or rituals that you go through in the morning or anything that you try and stick to on a, a daily or weekly basis yeah I, I'm, I'm a big exerciser so I, I for me to get on top of any we all suffer with a bit of stress I mean I work off a little bit of stress I think there's there's a good level and then there's there's a level where you go over and that's where maybe people tip over but I like it I like a little bit of pressure I work better on that but exercise really helps me maintain that you know some people may go turn to a bottle of wine or whatever it is they want to do but I'm a big exerciser so I like that I can I can read an email before exercise I can read the same email after exercise and I can read it completely differently so that's what it does for me that's what so yeah I, I, I'm, I'm an early person so I like to get up relatively early I don't like necessarily exercising in the morning but then I look through everything I've got to do I try and I'm quite mindful I, I, I think about responses I don't that's one thing that's changed I might be more reactive in the early days nowadays I'm much more mindful I'll, I'll look at things and how to manage things. Actually, if there's any any issues or confrontational issues, I tend not to use email or text anymore. I like face to face. That's another big thing that's changed. You know, intonation. I like to see people's faces, discuss it through with them, and especially depending on what people's mood are in. Like you say, reading yeah. something before exercising and then reading it afterwards. Yeah. There must be so many arguments and fallouts and firings because emails and texts have been wrong in to- <sighs> read in, in the wrong context. I, I just don't get into it anymore. You know, I, I would have done you know, in the early days. I just don't anymore. You know, I like face to face. I don't I don't overreact anymore, so my tolerance is much better. But exercise is a big part of that. It helps me cope with a lot of that stuff. So yeah, I like to just sit down, go through my emails have a think about how I'm responding what it is that they're that they're requiring and try and set things up I try and actually be proactive and get an answer before an email so you know I'll see what else is going on and the answer that they require I'll do a little bit of research about that get the answer and come back through that's really useful and I love employees doing that for me so I love an employee to sort of not only come up with an issue but maybe 
also volunteer maybe a strategy to resolve the issue and that's fabulous as a, as an as an in business owner you know there's nothing better than someone coming up with a have you thought about doing this or we've got this is or you could do this and that's that's great but you know it doesn't happen that often but that's you know as a business owner you like all that sort of stuff and they're, they're the people you you know you sort of keep an eye on oh, that's okay that's pretty that's pretty smart we like that so yeah and then i'll go into the office I like a bit of just quiet time and stuff just to get on top of things. So I'm working on the businesses, working through the, the emails, putting my whatever I need to put together. And then if there's any meetings planned, it's either on site or off site. So that happens fairly regularly through the week. And then I'll, I'll maybe do a small clinic. So I, do, I tend to do sort of small clinics, two, two and a half hour clinics a couple of times a week. And then i'm off arranging my exercise but you know kids are growing up now which makes life also a bit easier so you've got young children ben i don't know yeah yeah five and a three-year-old yeah it's tough uh, when they're young yeah it is tough the balance is tough so uh, mine are older now so again that does when they become more independent you're not doing school runs it it actually makes a big difference you know if you're trying to fit everything in you know it's 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 tough when they're little you know and you want to see the kids and sometimes when they're that little you don't see them you know if you're getting home at seven o'clock and you know and they're two and they're in bed or whatever you know it's tough so we've obviously talked about this evening, Kev, a lot of, of challenges and aspects of business that aren't industry specific. So with those lessons that you've learned and the people that you've met along the way and your own experiences, what are some of the sort of fundamental attributes or beliefs or skill sets that you think people need to have to be successful as a business owner? If you could sort of nail it down to one, two or three, what would you pick out? You've got to have resilience. Yeah, you've got to have determination. And motivation, they're they're the three for me. I just think I just think you've got to keep plugging away, keep knocking on the doors because you hit, you see it, you read it. Some doors don't open, and you've just you've just got to keep plugging away. You know, it still happens to me now, and you just learn that again. Another part of the business that I've learned about is sometimes we don't take work; we choose not to take work. In the early days, we might have taken everything. You know, these days we pick and choose a bit more. We've got to that stage where we can potentially do that if it doesn't work for us then that's fine and we can walk away from it in the early days we'd try and pick do everything you know and that's tough but yeah you've got to be resilient take the knocks be determined and be motivated uh, look after yourself physically and, and what motivates you kev do you have like a long-term vision that's that's further down the line five ten fifteen years or are you just naturally driven you've talked about the earlier days when you were competing obviously it's in your dna to be competitive but but where does that come from and what keeps you going now yeah, I mean, I look back from my family and I, I, I don't really know where it comes from, to be fair. I mean, I, I, you know, but anyway, going forwards, yeah, I just like, I like a little bit of a challenge, I think. I always have done, you know, in my early, to, from my late teens onwards. I don't think I'll ever stop. I can't see myself being fully retired. I want to do something. I do enjoy the clinical side of things. So I'll probably do a couple of days. I think I always will probably into my 70s and 80s. But the long-term goal, I mean, the two, two options, of course, are maybe to sell and maybe passive income, you know, where you can let the thing go, which is happening more and more now. So I'm controlling the business. If I can grow it to a level where you can put other people in at different levels and let the thing grow slowly or how, however uh, it wants to grow, but stand back a little bit. You know, I think a lot of businesses owners will do that a little bit passive income yeah i think surely that's got to be the main aim for most people is to grow a business to allow you to do the things that you want whenever yeah. you want with whoever you want definitely so yeah. if you haven't got that in mind then what else is there i suppose absolutely so. it's that life the work-life balance is, is critical now and you know i'm into my 50 early 50s now and it's uh, you get to an age as well i think in your, you know your 20s your 30s your 40s you, you bang away and you bang away and you, it's about you know I don't know what motiv- people are motivated by different things. It could be financially, it could be the next best car and, and things. But I think certainly at my age now, I used to be a bit like that, but now it's about work-life balance. It's about holidays. It's about quality time. And I've got to say, it makes you, actually, I think it makes you more of a rounded person. Actually, things naturally sometimes come to you when you're not really fighting hard for stuff. It's very, it's just, you reach a level. And I think a lot of business people will also say, you know, your turnover numbers and we talked about profit, of course, which is very important, but it's, it's the different levels that you reach and then you can move to the next level and but it's those early stages which is what you know we're talking about here is it's tough yeah and and you mentioned earlier particularly when you started out on your own as the solo business owner it was more difficult than you had thought what are some of the things that you think people perhaps don't realize before they start a business that you think they should know if they're going to go into it it's be careful not to get drawn into the business so that you know it eats you up uh, you know, being what we call, we've used these words, being the technician, you know, if you're making clocks or baking cakes, 
you know, it's very easy just to get sucked into that. And that's all you're doing, which is what I got sucked into in the early stages of just delivering, in my case, physio services. And you just don't get any time to develop the business. And then what happens is it's down to you and it just eats your time up, eats your life up. It's getting that balance right. That's the toughest bit. So what are some of the benefits that you found of being a business owner? Obviously, we've talked about the time commitments and the challenges and, and some of the sacrifices. But equally, what have you enjoyed over your time being in business? I actually take to the business. I, you know, I, I enjoy developing business and, and being in the business. The benefits, again, is once you get to a point where you can get that work-life balance, it's worth it. But it's hard work getting to that point, you know, and it's taken me a long time to get to that point. But once you've made it and the work-life balance is better and you can control your own time and your, your own boss, it's, it's a nice feeling. It's, it's a great place to be. And if you could go back to 21-year-old Kevin, give him one piece of advice, where were you at 21? 21, I was in first goal four, I think, leading up to that in the late 80s, early 90s. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, what would you pass on to him? I'd say probably chill out a, a little bit. I think I was a little bit sort of, what's the word, a little bit up my own ass a bit, I think. Yeah, I think I could have, even with my attitude now, probably been even more successful earlier on, probably. So, yeah. And I know that you like to read, Kev. So if you could recommend one business book to the audience, which one would it be? It would be The E-Myth by Gerber yeah yeah it was it was, a, it was a real revelation it's very simple actually and uh, it brings up the topic of becoming a technician so you know if you like you're making your clocks or you're cooking your cakes the technician is the guy that just does that all day every day now if you're happy doing that that's fine but typically the book would explain that you're stuck into that rut you're not going to have time to develop the business moving from a technician to a manager and then moving through to being an entrepreneur which involves you know stepping away from the business developing the business putting another technician an employee or someone being becoming that technician for you it's just very very simple i think but but really quite useful yeah and i think sometimes that is the rut that we all get stuck in in that we overcomplicate everything but i've, I've read that book myself it's, it's a very popular one i'm sure many of the audience have and when you do read that pretty much step-by-step -step process of transitioning from the the technician to the manager to the owner it makes it seem so simple but when the next day you're back in the office you're back firefighting and everything that you had thought you were going to implement and all those ideas that you had to simplify everything and, and get back to being an entrepreneur working on the business have gone to the back of the to the back of the queue so it's definitely a, one that i'd recommend as it's well definitely a fight it's a battle yeah and any links as with any other resources that we've mentioned in the interview so far will all be included at the show notes at benjaminbrain.co.uk forward slash kevin dash huffington uh, so make sure you check those out now staying on the book theme kev if you could write a business book about your own journey so far what would you call it i'd call it positive mental attitude okay pma nice. Yeah. Yeah. Give us a bit of an explanation. Why. Well, you know, I think it's just uh, it's all about the attitude, really. I think, you know, if you want to be successful, you've got to be driven. You've got to, you know, have that resilience within you to take all the knocks, be determined and be motivated. And I use the phrase, actually, when I did one of my fitness shows, uh, people took the mick out of me for it a little bit. But I think in one of my interviews, <laughs> I did mention PMA in one of the exercise challenges. And so, yeah, positive mental attitude. I think, you know, there's so many times you get challenged and, you know, I'm always... I regard myself quite good at overcoming things. You know, there's always, if I don't know the answer, I'll go and ask someone that does. And there's always, you know, there's always something, you know, someone says no, there's, there's always got to be some way of doing something. Yeah. And, and that positive mental attitude, do you think that is something that people are born with or do you think that you can develop it over time? And have you found it's developed in you or have you just been this way since early days no i think it's developed I, um, for me i mean it's 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 the army to sort of develop that side of things i think for me certainly not not as an entrepreneur but just to, just to the attitude thing you know that the the forces thing is is you know get the job done whatever it takes you know and be resilient and overcome really you know and, and I, that has helped me develop this side of things as, a, as i've i mean it's 24 years ago since i left that that environment but it's always it has set me up and i reflect back on that so yeah it, it is an attitude you know you've got you've, you've really got to be fairly determined have a plan and know what you're going to do so we're coming to the end of the interview now kev i've just got a couple more questions before we wrap up for the evening so if we were to be sat in front of somebody who is about to go into business for themselves and you could summarize everything that you've learned on your business journey and you could give this person just three pieces of advice that you think will see them cope best over the coming weeks months and years what would those three pieces of advice be know your market I think that's a classic one, but you've got to know what it is you're trying to do, sell, provide, know who you're going to sell it to. And it's easy for us to say it now. And I think, you know, we've all struggled with that. But, you know, it is true. Who are you selling your product to? I think 
for me, it's just having the determin- determination to see it through, keep working hard at it. And it's easy to say, have a plan and things. And I remember in the early days, people say, you know, you have your plan, have your, you know, your, your six months, your 12 months, your five. But I've got to say, honestly, it's very difficult to pin that down. So, but, you know, if you can get something together like that, it's, it can be useful. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And my final question for you today, Kev, if anybody wants to find out more about yourself or the services that you provide with Central Health, whereabouts can we find you online? Yeah, if you go to www.centralhealth.org.uk, you'll find a breakdown of all our all of our services. They're all linked in there. Yeah, okay. And again, all the links will be included in the show notes. So for anybody that wants to find out more about uh, Kev and the team, definitely make sure you head over and check those out. Well, Kev, that brings the interview to an end. So I just want to thank you so much for uh, taking your time out to share your business experiences and truths with us. You've been really honest and, and shared some great stuff in there. Thank you very much for coming to join us on the show tonight. I would like to wish you and the team at Central Health the very best of luck for the future and a big 2020. And to all the listeners out there, thank you again so much for tuning in. Really appreciate your support. Thanks for listening and looking forward to catching up with you on next week's episode of The Truth About Business. One final thing before you go, if you enjoyed this interview and want to make sure you don't miss out on the next episode with another real life business champion, make sure you subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, your favorite podcast app, or by visiting my blog at benjaminbrain.co.uk and hitting subscribe. At the blog, you'll also find the show notes to this episode, which includes all the relevant links to the website, social media channels, contact details, and anything else that was discussed in the episode. Just type in the name of the guest and that will bring that right up for you. And finally, I'm always on the search for great business owners who would be happy to spare just a couple of hours of the time to share their business experience with our audience. So if you know of anyone that would make a great guest or you'd like to feature yourself, just let me know. Send an email to hello at benjaminbrain.co.uk and I'll reply personally as soon as possible. Also, if you've got any feedback, questions that you'd like me to ask our guests or any other suggestions, I am definitely all ears. That email address again is hello at benjaminbrain.co.uk. So that's it for this episode. I just want to thank you sincerely for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay hungry, stay fearless, get out there and make it happen.